last session. Um, our first speaker is Laurent Freidel, who's going to talk about quantum geometry and entanglement from corner symmetry. Okay, thank you. I want to thank the organizer for you know this beautiful conference, very diverse, and the opportunity to speak here. I uh, also want to mention, you know, uh, here I'm going to give a bit of a summary of many ideas that we have been developed with many, many, I was lucky to have many, uh, many bright collaborators. And for people who are interested, uh, some of these ideas are kind of summarized, you know, in a, not for a, a quantum gravity audience, but, but as you see, some of these ideas are very uh, uh, general in some way. So, uh, so if you want to have a look. So the, the main, I mean, one of the questions I'm interested in, like many people in quantum gravity already, what are the fundamental degrees of freedom? But uh, what I want to do is kind of propose a new way to look at quantum gravity. Instead of having a top-down approach where I postulate what is the fundamental theory, I, I kind of want to have a more like bottom-up approach, uh, which is rooted on, uh, let's say, semi-classical physics, maybe non-perturbative in G Newton, but, you know, trying to understand really uh, the essence of uh, um, what, what is the, the nature of the constraints uh, due to gravity. And, uh, and it turns out that there's a very, simp uh, very fundamental question that, that allows you to go away, way, which is uh, really, uh, essentially, you know, what is the nature of entanglement uh, across subsystems, or, or some, something that, in fact, we don't completely control, which is how do we quantize quantum field theory and gravity on finite regions? Uh, uh, and I think, you know, we want to understand finite regions quantum systems because, in some sense, you know, the smallest one, where this is the quantum gravity point, the biggest one, it's the S matrix, so this is a good intermediate between the two. Uh, so. Uh, the, the idea, you know, that can organize that is, is local holography, and you can view it as a, as a fusion of, of uh, some of the key ideas of holography with some of the key ideas of quantum geometry, that uh, the geometry has to become quantum and represented by quantum operators there. So, um, now, of course, in holography, the, the emergence of, uh, you know, cl uh, classically connected space-time is already due to the nature of entanglement, so that's why it's interesting to look at it. Um, now, what we're going to show, and if you fall asleep in the talk, at least I, I want to make my main point here, what we're going to show is that in gravity, uh, something special happens, that the subregion entanglement is entirely controlled by a symmetry group that we call the corner symmetry group. That group is universal, and uh, I'm going to show you what it is, and then we're going to study a bit some of its property. And this, this symmetry group just follows from the expression of the gauge invariance. So in some sense, if you break gauge invariance, you're not going to have the symmetry, but the presence of the symmetry is a necessary condition for you to be able to reconstruct a space which has the gauge invariance. And then at the quantum level, now that we have a group, you know, we, we have the job of trying to find and classify this representation, and finding the quantum representation of that group amounts to uh, getting towards a picture of quantum geometry. And so the, the main point of the talk is to essentially show that entanglement in gravity is equivalent to corner symmetry. Entanglement is a very vanilla thing in quantum mechanics, but when you have a symmetry, there's a charge conservation that has to happen across the, the link of the entanglement. And one of the purposes of holography is somehow to show that this, this symmetry is so strong and so large that it controls all of the entanglement. Um, and so what what this allows us to do is get a, a picture, which is not a full picture of quantum gravity, but it allows us to go from the continuum to some kind of a quantization, to, to a precise quantization of geometry through the quantization of the charge of symmetry. And symmetry is the one thing that we know to quantize without any uh, uh, too many ambiguities. And then uh, what it also shows is that recent work I've shown that, you know, I'm going to talk about quantum gravity in the book, but I've used these techniques a lot to talk to people in celestial holography where, where the corner is very big. And here we have much more control and perturbative control onto uh, what it is. But uh, the beauty is that now there's no distinction between people doing, or at least we have a, a, a common language between people doing the S matrix and people doing quantum geometry. And uh, for me, it's very fruitful because then you can use the different insights and techniques uh, between the two. So what's the, you know, what's the main point? The main, problem, the main uh, object I want to study is the quantum causal diamond. So you use, let's say, a Cauchy slice, uh, which I call sigma, and you decompose this Cauchy slice into, you know, left and right. 
okay, an interior and an exterior, and there's going to be an intending surface, that's what I call the corner, uh, S here. And then, of course, you know, the, uh, in, a, in a fixed background, you can shine light rays out of that, and you get a, a causal uh, domain of dependence, that's your quantum causal diamond, which, of course, is going to fluctuate in, in gravity. So now, you know, um, usually, uh, we assign the algebra of observable associated to the slice sigma, and maybe the slice uh, sigma L. Uh, uh, and then we want to understand, understanding uh, uh, subdivision is you want to understand how does the system, the quantum system behaves when you subdivide, when you make this subdivision. So if you're in quantum mechanics, uh, which is quantum information, then, you know, it's very nice because then you have the, the algebra of observable decomposed as a kind of a union of local algebra of observable associated to the left and to the right, and that the Hilbert space also decomposed as a tensor product. So we have a matter, quantum information, everything is, is, is nice, and we have a beautiful way, and we can assign density matrix to subregion because of that. Now, in relativistic quantum theory, the first problem arises is that we, we lose the factorizability of the, of the Hilbert space. So the Hilbert space attached to the total region cannot be written as a tensor product of Hilbert spaces attached to each subregion. For the observable, it's OK. You still have a notion of local observable, but there's no notion of local states. And the reason behind that is that uh, uh, you, know, you have universality or uh, entanglement at uh, the region. The Adam are property of the vacuum states. And therefore, you have infinite vacuum entanglement. So you lose this uh, factorizability. Another way to see that is that you know, in, in relative Non-relativistic quantum theory, if you have the uh, states attached to the left regions or to the right regions, they kind of uh, are orthogonal to each other, but in quantum theory, they are not. And this is the rich leader theorem, right? The fact that you can manipulate something very far away just because of this uh, fundamental vacuum entanglement. And this vacuum entanglement, it's UV divergent. Otherwise, it would not be, it would become factorizable. So this, this is really the, the, the the object that we are after in quantum gravity, this is the one that bugs us, the fact that somehow we lose factorizability, so we really have to face that. This is UV divergences. And it means you cannot define the notion of density matrix attached to subregion in quantum field theory. Okay, so now in gravity, in fact, the non-local, it, it goes even beyond, because in gravity, of course, it's a field theory, so we don't, fact, we don't have factorizability of the Hilbert space, but we don't even have factorizability of the, uh, the observable, the gauge of you know, gauge invent observable now, uh, uh, because the observable have to be gauge invent, and in fact, gauge invent observable on origin sigma L, and gauge invent observable on sigma right, I don't, th I'm still missing some observable, which are going to be the one which are Wilson lines across, for instance, the left and the right. Okay, so, so clearly there's something interesting. So, you know, as much as uh, in the literature people went from quantum mechanics to quantum field theory, and there's an uh, infinite number of papers about that, and the type 3, etc., there's very few people that go from quantum field theory to, go to, to gauge in gravity, and this is what I want to focus on. Okay, so uh, what's happening here, uh, I mean, clearly we have to kind of uh, be able to deal with that. We want to be able to understand what is the decomposition of observable into subregions, and, and if we can talk about quantum states associated to subregions. And of course, to recover quasi-locality, uh, the idea is that you need, you need to introduce a physical system, which is the, the, the dressing of the states. And to understand what the dressing of the states are, you need to understand what symmetry control this dressing. So this is, this is the idea. So why is symmetry so important? Well, in gauge theory, as you all know, the main uh, aspect, and let's say this focus on gravity, where no boundary exists, you know, if you, if you try to compute what is the Hamiltonian of the system, well, it's simply a constraint, so it's zero. So called problem of time. Um, okay, so the time evolution generator is always zero in gravity uh, if there's no boundary. Now, the situation changes in the presence of space time boundary or space time corner. And I'm going to distinguish the two. So, a boundary is a codimension one object, and a boundary requires the boundary conditions to be defined. We saw that in ADS-CFT, you have to put reflective, otherwise, you don't know what you're talking about. You cannot define your robot space. Now, a corner is very different. A corner is codimension two, and the beauty about a corner is that 
I don't need to impose any boundary condition to define what I mean by phi theory on a, on a corner. Okay? And it's very important because I don't want to, to have to impose particular boundary condition because I want, I want quantum gravity to decide for me exactly how things are going to fluctuate. Okay? So corner is a boundary of a slice, but it's not a boundary of space-time. And I don't need boundary conditions for corners. Okay, so this is a corner. The corner is just the endpoint of this causal diamond. And now, in this presence of this uh, corner, uh, going back to Emily Nestor, that's what she proved, you know, asked by, by Klein and, and uh, uh, but, you know, that's the, the, the one paper she wrote in physics where she really showed that in the presence of boundary, the Hamiltonian is a pure corner term. And she computed that term in GR in 1918. And we kind of forgot about it for, I don't know, a long time. Um, so it's due to a mean author that we know that we can write this, this subject like that. Often people cite Lee and Wild and people like that, but you, you open the paper of Nether, it's all there. All these formula of Ayers, Wild, etc. They're all already there. Um, okay, so as I say, corners and like boundary do not need a specific uh, boundary condition. Now, why is it interesting? This essentially it is, it's, it's goes back to, uh, you know, Don Maroff and maybe others that, you know, when people were, were trying to understand what is the conceptual nature of holography, then, you know, they were saying that they were wondering, well, here it is. You know, the energy of a total system, and, uh, and, and then uh, they was doing it in the case of boundary conditions where you have conservations of energy, and then here you conclude from the Nether theorem that the energy of the system is completely determined by, you know, uh, data on the boundary. Okay? That's kind of a... Uh, so that this property, which is essentially the property of gauge invariance, is also the other face of gauge invariance in simply holography. Um, okay, and so what we did with William is just, uh, you know, uh, extend somehow this notion of what we call local holography to any kind of a cut you can put on a slice, because it's always trying try to, to see how far you can go. Um, okay, so, so now, you know, this, so now, now what, what do you have? You have, you have many gauge transformations here that will have vanishing charges. These ones are gauge symmetries. And then there are some uh, transformations which have no vanishing charges, and these ones are not gauge symmetries. They're going to be the symmetries of your subsystems. And the, because they're symmetries of your subsystems, they're really physical objects that you need to quantize. So this group of symmetries here is what we call the corner symmetry group. Uh, and then one of the, the main uh, item that is coming to the forefront now is that the modular group, which is really the, the group of in gravity, the, you know, the group of, uh, of modular transformation, which is kind of the statistical group of symmetry due to subregion, is just a subgroup. It's a particular subgroup generated by a Casimir of the corner symmetry group. So somehow, you know, that, that's why the corner symmetry group is also important. It's a symmetry group, but it's also part of this kind of a, um, well, it's part of the modular group. But the modular group is a subgroup of the corner symmetry group. So the notice here tells us that these charges, you know, uh, satisfies an algebra. Now we know that the charges also can be represented in terms of the, the metric variables. So uh, the, the notice theorem tells us that, uh, uh, you know, some component of the, the metric, particular component of the metric, after I have imposed the constraints, are specifically non-commutative. And this is something you can prove in the continuum. Uh, so it means that the non-commutativity of these metric components evaluated in the corner is really a non-commutative geometry that you're, you're dealing with. And therefore, finding the representation of this uh, corner symmetry group is equivalent to find, you know, to quantizing geometry or some element of quantum geometry. So I hope the project is clear. Um, okay, so what is, what is, so let's do a gravity. By gravity, I mean a theory of purely metrical. Uh, so we look at the region R. Uh, you know, with a boundary, so in a slice, with a boundary S here, uh, uh, which is the entangling sphere. And now, as I said, the, the corner symmetry group, or the extended corner symmetry group, is the, is the symmetry group of uh, uh, transformation, diffeomorphism transformations, which have non-vanishing charges. Um, and so what you find is that in metric gravity, this group is made of three parts. So first, of course, it contains the diffeomorphism along the sphere, so think about the sphere, we're, we're going to go the way there. The sphere is a kind of a, a fluid and you can move along the sphere. Then there's a, a SL to our S, which means one per point on the sphere, there's a possibility of two null direction, and you, you have a possibility to do boost in this two-dimensional uh, plane here. And then in general, I mean, and then there's also two null directions, you, you have the possibility to do super translation. 
So, so often people call that super rotation, you know, super boost, uh, and super translation. And uh, I'm going to focus on the blue part because the super translations are different. They kind of move uh, uh, one, one slice to, to the other, and I have to be able to compute the flux. Uh, but first, I want to understand some other kinematics. Like, think about taking a snapshot of geometry at a given time, and I want to know what are the elements, what are the constituents of the geometry, and then, of course, how they evolve in time through the flux and how these charges couple to gravitational radiation. Here, we're going to spend more time in the, in the first part of the, of the project. Uh, no, so now, something which is extremely important is that this group is doubly universal. So, what I mean by doubly universal is that it's the same group whether you have a small s or a big s, a round s or a wiggly s. It's not that it's only true for the black hole horizon, it's true for any cut. So, whether it's an infinity team on one or, uh, or an asymptotic large one. And then also, uh, less of this. Uh, which was proven by, by Speranza, uh, based on work by Bell. Uh, this group is the same no matter what is your, your action. That is, you can take action in both or any higher derivative uh, corrections, you're going to get exactly the same group of symmetry. What's going to change is the canonical representation. So it tells you that you know, if you think of quantum corrections as adding higher derivative, you still have to represent the group. And I think what it means for me it means that whatever is your theory of quantum gravity, and I don't care where it comes from, at some point, at some level, you have to find a representation of that group. Any theory of quantum gravity, or if it's not a representation exactly of that group, you have to tell me, well, that group is deformed by the Planck string or the string scale or whatever, but you have to go back to that because if you don't find that group, you are fundamentally breaking the homomorphism invariance. Which, okay, maybe it's, if it's your option, then we won't talk. But, and the beauty is that here, you see, um, it's very theory agnostic, so that we should all agree that whatever the theory is, in your theory, you should be able to do that calculation and get, and get an answer for, for what this uh, object here. So, okay, so that's why I kind of uh, uh, like it. In the, in the sense, it's kind of a firm ground in which you can stand and be the, a much more fundamental picture of, of, of geometry. So, uh, okay, so usually maybe you have heard about a symmetry group at asymptotic infinity, etc. Uh, okay, so here an equation is missing. Uh, I, I just have the, the, the group I was writing before here. This is the group I was writing before. Now, of course, I can look at a subgroup that preserves a null direction, and it's the, the symmetry group of null surfaces. Uh, which was one known, which we call BMSW. So this is something that was identified in the in the literature on horizon, uh, uh, you know, an isolated horizon, dynamical horizons. But it's also the group of symmetry that happens at infinity. So it's not like there's zillions of different symmetry groups. There's only one symmetry group that you have to represent. And then if you go to infinity, you just represent a, a, a reduction because you have a proof for another direction. Okay, so. Uh, um, it goes back with this universality of, of, of what the group is. So, so the study of this uh, representation theory at for final group, you know, feeds the one at infinity and vice versa, in some sense. So BMSW, and here in BMSW, you have another direction here. Uh, what are the infinitesimal generators? Very simple, you have a super translation. You know, you have a tangent vector in the coordinate where A, and then you have uh, the vial is kind of this boost, which is very important, uh, and at infinity, Okay, an equation is missing again here. The, the W, what happens at infinity is that this val factor is proportional to the divergence of the vector field uh, because, because of the conformal structure. Okay, so, uh, so that's the group. Um, and then, um, okay, so if you have a group of symmetry, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm not going to give you exactly the formula how it relates to the, the metric components, but you know, we, you want to understand what are the representations, what are the Casimirs of this object. Uh, now, you know, it's a semi-direct product. If you, if you remember something about Poincaré, you know, SO3 acting on R, you know that the representation theory are classified by the little group representation. So what are the little group? The, so the first thing you have to appreciate is that you, you want to understand what is the Casimir of SL2R. And, and the beauty is that in all the model you can imagine the Casimir of SL2 R is simply the area uh, form on that sphere. Okay, so uh, uh, so uh, so and you can you can you can understand geometrically what is the subgroup generated by this this uh, this uh, Casimir. It's really if you have a null surface and they give you a metric. If you have a surface and give you a metric, there's two preferred null directions. 
you know, uh, which are the directions where the, these normal vectors are null for that particular metric. And then, of course, there's a preferred subgroup, which is the subgroup that preserves that null plane. This is the group generated by, by data rate. It's the, it's the group of boosts, okay, along the null plane. So this area element is the, is the local affine boost group, if you want. And now, the, the, what is the little group? The little group is the group of diffeomorphism that preserves uh, uh, that Casimir. So it's the area preserving diffeomorphism group. Okay, and uh, uh, luckily, you know, Arnold and all the Russian mathematicians have developed the theory of representation of this group. So it's kind of well known, maybe not as well known as the Virazero group, but it's, there's a lot of literature where you can, you can use to, to uh, uh, quantize. So, uh, and physically, in fact, this group of symmetry, when I replace uh, SL2R by just uh, functions, and I think of square root of G as a density, is really the group of uh, a barotropic perfect fluid. That if you quantize, you get helium, uh, helium 4 um, uh, in 2D. If you, I mean, if you quantize it in 3D, you get helium 4. Uh, okay, so uh, the air preserving diffeomorphism group as a generator, which is the vorticity, and then, okay, you can construct, essentially, it's the fluid vorticity. What I'm saying is that you have a diffeomorphism generator, so you have a notion of momenta generator. You can compute the vorticity of this momenta. There's some decoration to the, the fact that it's non abelian. You can prove that this object satisfies the, 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 the area preserving algebra. And then the casimirs of this algebra are simply these moments of the vorticity, here, uh, which is something that is used in predicting the weather on the sphere. You know, the, the, the casimirs are exactly the things that do not change very fast, even in this chaotic system. And, and that's how we, we can predict the weather for a few days. Okay, so, uh, so here we have a complete uh, classification of representations when, the, when the, the, um, the, the area form is strictly positive in the continuum. Now, uh, okay, so let's talk a little bit about edge mode. Of course, here, yeah, you know, there's a bit of a sort of in quantum gravity, so which surface am I talking about? How am I going to place a surface in space-time? Well, you know, in order to do that, I need you to give you a field where that surface is. And this is what I call an edge mode field. Now, in field theory, you know, it's kind of a simply a coordinate and it's completely decoupled from the phase space. But in gravity, it is not decoupled from the phase space. So the edge mode variable are kind of physical in the sense that, you know, like our four edge modes, two are transversal and two are longitudinal, you know, they, they uh, are promoted to operators. Uh, here, sigma is the position in the sphere. So what you have is this kind of four operators associated with the sphere, and they are kind of necessary uh, to define the locations of the sphere in a different variant way. Okay, and of course, because they're operators, they need to fluctuate, so it's perfectly consistent with your notion that, uh, you know, it's kind of hard to precisely locate uh, a, a sphere element here. So now what the edge modes allow is, uh, okay, here I'm going very fast, the possibility to define gauge invariant observable because you can use them to dress your observable. And what it does, and this is the construction we did with, uh, with uh, uh, Anthony in 2016, we constructed the algebra of uh, 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 gauge invariant observable, which contains, you know, the, the, the naive algebra, and then there's a wedge, co wedge product here with the algebra on the boundary. It turns out this algebra has a mathematical name, it's called the cross product algebra. And so the extended algebra we constructed is simply uh, the cross product algebra with the symmetry group. And um, now recently people have been excited about the cross product algebra because there's another result by Cohn that shows that, uh, you know, if you have a cross product algebra, uh, uh, by the, and one of the elements of the symmetry group is the modular Hamiltonian, then you go from type 3 to type 2. So you are resolving already UV singularity. So this is a mathematical theorem that the presence of edge modes, which kind of makes sense. Once you allow somehow the boundary to have certain quantum fluctuation, you can mathematically prove that you don't go to type 1, which would be like, you know, full resolution of the singularity, but you, you go to type 2, which means that you have a, you have a density matrix. And the main, the main reason it's possible here is because in gravity, the, the in reality, the modular Hamiltonian, so what is the modular Hamiltonian? The modular Hamiltonian is the log of, it's proportional to the log of your, you know, density matrix, or would-be density matrix, and, and this object here is exactly equal to the, to the uh, area operator. And the reason it's exactly equal to the area operator is because of the quantum constraints. 
Okay, so uh, what I call this property uh, uh, the quantum equivalence principle. It's not true for a general phi theory, but it's good for a theory of gravity that the modular Hamiltonian is kind of a geometrical object. How, how, how much time do I have? We started, uh, yeah, you started Okay. Um, so so that, that was a little bit fast, but it shows you this, this connection between. Uh, uh, so now I go back to this idea where well, this group of symmetry is really the group of symmetry of a quantum fluid. So this sphere now, I suppose I live on this, on this sphere, I can think of it, I have a moment operator, I have a density operator, I have exactly all the elements to define a quantum fluid. Uh, in fact, the representation theory was defined. So I can, I can think of a quantum fluid, and then I can, the beauty is that I can say, well, uh, and what is the analogy? The analogy is the area density is really the fluid density, the outer curvature is really the fluid vorticity. And then, uh, these are the two Casimirs, so therefore the quantum representations are, are labeled by, by uh, what choice I make for these densities on the sphere. Uh, and we, okay, we can do that semi-classically. So, uh, what is a classical fluid? The classical fluid is a fluid where uh, both these density are, 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 are continuous with respect to the Lebesgue measure. Okay? If you take both rho and omega to be continuous with respect to the Lebesgue measure, you're describing a classical perfect fluid. But now, uh, you know, it's a measure, so I if you think that these measures are discrete measures, these are different quantum representations of your, of your symmetry group, then you get a quantum fluid. In particular, you know, this is how uh, uh, Lando somehow discovered the atom. He said you can discover the atom just by quantizing the symmetry group of a perfect fluid. And you can discover the nature of helium 4 by quantizing the velocity, which means you're quantizing the, the, the vorticity. So it's kind of interesting that it's kind of an effective method, but you know, now in this effective description, I already have quantile geometry, just purely from uh, representation theory. Uh, so this is what I'm doing here. Uh, so what's interesting is that, you know, if you push a little bit this picture, you get some, some kind of constituent picture where, uh, you know, atomization of the fluid, which is really the atom, is essentially the area constituent, and the vortex quantization is the, is the momenta. And you can write explicitly the quantum representation labels for what these objects are, you know, on the 2D sphere. Uh, for the density, it's kind of obvious. For the momenta, it's a little bit less obvious. They are classified by, in fact, uh, a conformal weight and a spin, which are exactly the same, the same labels of uh, conformal representation you would have on the 2D sphere. And that's how that explains the, the link with celestial holography. Uh, at infinity, uh, you have the same thing, except that these excitations now are simply the graviton, right? And the spin here has to be true for gravity. So in finite, you get some uh, a notion of area constituent, in the, and we are still in the continuum. I'm, I'm not putting any discretization. I'm just looking at quantum representations that now have an external uh, number of excitations there. And so, in that in that sense, I would say that you know discretization is not postulated, but kind of derived from quantum mechanics. And so now the link with loop gravity, and it was done by Wolfgang Wieland in 19, is that you know, in ancient Cartan gravity with an easy parameter, you, you can argue that this operator here needs to be gapped. And therefore, if it needs to be gapped, uh, somehow you, you know, uh, uh, um, the discretization or the atomization is kind of a necessity. Okay, but it's really about uh, representation theory. Now, as I say. Another option that we're exploring is that area preserving deformorphism is at the core of it, and we know that the area preserving deformorphism can be regulated as the group of symmetry of a uh, matrix model. Okay, so, so let me, uh, okay, maybe I don't have much time here. Here it was very much the static, and, and looking at the representation theory of this, you know, symmetry group. Um, uh, you know, what, what's happening right now, there's a lot of a new understanding, first at infinity, but now on finite surface, about uh, uh, the ratio to equation, and the quantum ratio to equation, there was a talk on the other session about quantum ratio to equation, uh, the time like one, but here we're looking at the null one, and, and remarkably, now we have enough control that we, we know how to quantize every, at least at the operator level, and we're looking at the states, every kind of this uh, simple constituent along the null rays. Uh, and, and there's a beautiful geometrical setting that, li like a time like infinity, you have a, you can just write the, the, these conservation equations as a Carolian conservation equation. Carol means that uh, c equal to zero limit. Okay. Uh, and we know the canonical structure. Uh, 
Yeah, there's a beautiful, I mean, that, 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 that slide is of a talk, but just to give you, we, we understand the canonical variable, we understand the conservation equation. Uh, it, it took us a long time to go, I think, you know, the time back surface, it's well known that you have a relativistic fluid. Here we, we understand now the nature of the Carolian fluid. Um, so I want to take a summary. So what I, uh, I presented here is that there's profound consequences of Noether theorem for gravitational theory which leads to kind of a new picture of quantum geometry as a representation state uh, of the corner symmetry group at every cut of entanglement here. Now, this, this corner symmetry group en encodes non-commutativity of the geometrical observable associated with subregions. And to me, that's, you know, they represent, uh, you know, a quantum geometry in that sense. Um, now, if you push, if you push it, you take seriously this representation it leads to a discretization of space from the representation of this continuum infinite dimensional group. A little bit like, you know, you can trace the Razor and you find a gap and you find some discrete spectra, but this is a quantum property of representation. It's not something classical. Uh, and now, as we, s you know, uh, uh, there's a notion of edge mode that needs to be put there. You need to have variables that really dress your observable to tell you where you are. And these edge modes are now, can are not automatically proven to be, to be uh, exactly the fundamental reason at the semi-classical level between the type three, type two uh, uh, improvement that happens in QFT. And, uh, okay, and dynamics along null surfaces are, are kind of interesting. There's a wild history of, you know, uh, horizons and quasi-horizons and, and gravity wave generation, but I think now we can start to, to look at it with a, a bit more of a quantum, uh, quantum eye. Thank you. Thank you for the beautiful talk. Uh, are there any questions? Understood correctly, this is just pure gravity you are talking about. Yeah, the group of symmetry doesn't change with matter. matter yeah, that's what yeah. I was asking. Yeah. If you yeah. add matter, what happens? You have the same uh, group. Well, but yeah, you have the same group. The degrees of freedom, do you, do you see them? Or, uh, I mean, you, it, what you see is the energy, the energy and the momentum. The area, but then uh, what happens? You see this? What, what do you see? You see energy and momentum. The, the mechanism I, I described of the, the Noether theorem, the fact that the charges becomes a pure boundary term, it's true for any coupling to any, any matter. And now, you know, if you have matter field, you can look at the reaction of how the edge modes kind of responds to the influx of matter. But in the end of the day, the matter creates a source for the gravity field in the same way that the graviton creates a source for itself. So, um, You don't expect any big differences. I mean, there's going to be a big difference from the fact that now geometry is quantized. So, so the big difference is that the quantization of geometry has a big effect on, on the UV property of matter. Yeah. But you say geometry is quantized, you mean the areas? Uh, I, mean, I mean the representations of the symmetry group. That's the, here it's under, yeah. It's, uh, so that it includes areas or? One of the elements is the area, yeah, but it's it much more. Uh, do you have like distances? Do you? Well, the momenta contains more information. There are more charges there. There's an infinite number of charges per point. So mm -hmm. the dictionary is, is uh, I mean, for instance, people have spent, you know, the, the entire literature, I mean, there's a huge part of literature on ADS-CFT in connection with, with quantum information, which is just about understanding the spectra of the modular operator <coughs> along one null rays. And so, looking at the, you know, the, the, the property of that operator on one point of the sphere and looking at the rest. So, you have a lot of geometrical information there that needs to be decoded. Can you say something about the matter, like uh, quantization matter, or, or is just uh, something you put by hand? Uh? In, in that picture, matter is just a source. Yeah, uh, thanks, Laurent, for the very nice uh, summary talk, um, and also for connecting it uh, with a region, recent discussion on the cross product. Um, can you actually maybe go back to the to the slide? So I think I didn't quite catch.
much um, how the cross product is formed here. You're saying that it's built from basically the um, the modular Hamiltonian and then essentially the dressed observable. So uh, yeah, yeah. So let me. So there, there's two. There's two elements. That first is in, in 2016 with uh, with William because of the the the, the, the first gauging variant observable. I have to shift it with the region using, using somehow this edge mode, which is the position of the boundary, and then we show that you have to dress an observable with respect to that position. Now, um, you know, I just recently uh, discovered that this construction that we call it the extended algebra, but then if you, if you look at the papers of Tomita, you know, in the 1970s, this is really, and you allow yourself to have a bigger group than usual, this is exa what we did with William is exactly a cross product. So the, the, the algebra of gauge invariant observable associated with region is really the, the, the naive algebra, you know, extended uh, with the the uh, the, the, uh, it, the group algebra, like a fusion. It's a cross product. It's a semi-direct product. Okay. So uh, I mean, this will be explained in the paper to come with uh, 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 Elliot here. And now um, the link with the modular group is that you have to say, okay, so far so good. Uh, what you have to argue is that uh, uh, the modular group is a subgroup of the corner symmetry group, <coughs> right? So you have to you have to kind of uh, permit at the quantum level this equality, which is a classical e equality uh, at the quantum level. So you have to identify the area as the generator of the modular group. You could say it's 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 either a conjecture or it's a postulate of quantum gravity. I call it the quantum equivalence principle. So I'm going to you know look at this. Let's say more as a postulate about quantum gravity, where you you you, you postulate you postulate that the in gravity. This is what I was saying about symmetry equal entanglement. Uh, that's kind of the, ma the the mathematical formulation of it. Um, and then maybe one last thing, since you now have a type two algebra, I guess you have a maximal entropy state. Also, um, do you have a particular interpretation of that? Um, work by Witten and so on, I guess that's related to the visitor. Yeah, we, we're looking into that. I mean, maximum, when you have a symmetry charge uh, state and you have, a, you have the equality of the charge, there was a talk yesterday about symmetry charge. So, so in some sense, it's very natural to say that the maximum entanglement state is the one which just share the, the same uh, uh, charge pair on, on both ways. Um, but I think the, the, the type 2 is even before you requantize geometry, which is it's almost kind of kinematical the, at that level. It's kind of a, uh, it's almost too easy <laughs> in some sense, the written reduction. It's just due to the presence of the fact that I mean, the mechanism, if you think about it, is very simple. It's just that now you have, a, you have an edge mode variable, and, and that edge mode variable has finite fluctuations. And therefore, the corresponding conjugate variable, which is the modular Hamiltonian, uh, uh, you know, does, cannot have infinite fluctuation. And if it doesn't have infinite fluctuations, you have resolved your missing parities. That's kind of the mechanism behind the, the, the physical mechanism behind the, the, the technical type 3 to type 2. Thanks. I propose we save further questions for the discussion session uh, later. And let's thank the speaker again.